So what we've done is collated, summarized um, the, the, the data from those individual wells and put them into what I'll call our, our, our database. And there's a number, there's a lot of, quite a lot of parameters in the database, um, obviously including the, the dimensions that we measure from our images, eroded area being the one we'd consider to be the key, the key dimension. Eroded area is important because that's our, that's our best indicator for how much propent has been placed into a individual perforation. And then we sum that up at, at cluster level, stage level, well level and overview of all those wells as we're doing now. So but in individual perforation eroded area is probably our key key measurement along with those other parameters you see there. And then we also have obviously information on the, the location of that individual perforation, which 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 stage and cluster it was in, what phase it was shot at. Um, we have information on the on the condition of the perforation. Again, primarily interested on whether it's eroded or uneroded, and we measure that in a in a couple. We evaluate that in a couple of ways. We'll discuss those in the in the next slide. Okay, and we typically have very good information, complete information on the on the design of the stage those individual perforations come from. So whether that stage is been engineered or it's a geometric stage. We know the length, the cluster, spacing, how many clusters, all, all those type of parameters are we normally know very, very well. Um, the perforating charge is obviously uh, an interesting thing to look at as well to see how those affect where, where propent's placed. Unfortunately, I have to say we don't always get complete information on that. Um, but when we do, it's in the database and, and we uh, We'll, I'll show you some results relating to the to the perforating charges. The, I, sh I should also mention there's a couple of parameters that we don't have available that I that I wish we we did in the database. Um, I guess those are, are probably the, the the rock the rock properties. Um, clearly, that makes a difference to to where the where the frac goes, how easily or or otherwise it is for. For the frac to get into a particular bit of rock, we we never we never see that information. That's obviously that stays with the stays with the operator. And the other one would be the the frac pr parameters themselves. We don't often get those either. So the the volumes pumped, the rates used, the type of propent, the type of fluid, that type of information clearly as well has uh, has an impact on. On how much erosion, and from that we infer how much propent has been been placed. But we don't we don't get that information often enough to to have considered it in this in this study. Okay, so we haven't we haven't controlled for any of those parameters in the in the results that you see. But overall, we've got this database with with over half a million data points in there. So there's you know there's lots of opportunities for how you can slice and dice that data and the paper really is that that's what it's about we, we've we've looked for correlations and patterns in the in this set of data and tried to try to present the ones that are most interesting most most relevant uh, back back to you okay um we, we do spend a bit of time in the paper looking at the the stage design and how that affects Propent, propent placement, propent distribution. I thought it'd be interesting for you to see see what we had available um, in in the database. So here I'm, I'm going to plot the number of stages in the database against the, the the count of clusters per stage. So that's you know that clusters per stage is a a key parameter that gets a lot of debate as to you know how many clusters you should have in your stage. Should you have a small number, a large number? Um, relates to spacing and, and length of stages as well. But we, we're looking at the clusters per stage here. And the, the plot here now shows you how many we had for various for various designs. So you see the peaks there at 5, 10, and, and 15 clusters per stage. Those, are, those you could say, are the most popular designs. 
of the of the in the wells that we that we looked at. Um, I don't know why multiples of five are, are popular, but it seems that they are. Um, you can also see cluster thirteen uh, stages with thirteen clusters per stage were not uh, were not very popular. Just one. So I, I suspect that's more to do with something superstitious rather than rather than some engineering decisions behind that. But I could be I could be wrong. Uh, and we can also we can also break this down further into looking at how many of these stages were a geometric design and how many were an engineered design. And you see we've got roughly equal numbers. Which is which is deliberate actually um, the one the wells we selected to put into the, the study so we had roughly equal numbers so we could make comparisons between these two two main types of stage design and and you, you'll notice I use slightly different terms here geometric shot clusters and variable shot clusters just to be clear specifically we we looked at the count of perforations in each cluster to determine whether they were geometric, if they were all the same, or what you might call an engineered stage if they were variable. You know, I, I recognize there's probably slightly different definitions of what a geometric stage might be, for, for example, but that, that's what we went with in, in the paper. I think you can probably consider in most cases geometric shot cluster is synonymous with a, a geometric stage and variable shot cluster is uh, an, an engineered stage. Okay, and then before, before I start presenting the results to you, I just wanted to make sure everybody was familiar with the, the method we use and, and also just a quick opportunity to, to comment on a couple of, couple of key parameters that maybe maybe getting a little bit more discussion now as, as different different options for measuring perforation erosion are are emerging so our our method obviously we're using photographic images of, of the of the perforations and we we evaluate um, erosion using a couple of methods the, the first one is you're already doing it you're looking at that perforation and you're doing a visual evaluation of that. So that perforation we would say was a, an uneroded perforation, and we can identify that. Let me get my laser pointer going here. No, didn't work. There we go. So we can identify that a couple of ways. Firstly, by the the circularity, the roundness of the of the entry hole here on um, on the ID of, of the pipe. But also here, where around that entry hole, um, where we can see some burrs and rough rough edges on on the perforation, and if you compare that with a perforation that has clearly been eroded, you'll you'll immediately notice the change in shape, how this one's become elongated and and, and enlarged, uh, and these rough edges no longer exist, and and they they've been replaced by evidence of smoothing and rounding as the propens gone in into the perforation so visually you can you can see the see the difference that's our first method of evaluating the perforations and then secondly you can see the measurements here that we that we make of the perforation so what we do there is um, determine the perimeter of the perforation and then we count the pixels in, inside it, and then we convert that, that, that pixel count into a dimension, a, a, a diameter, or a length, an area, referencing this um, calibration blade. So that's a centralizer arm deliberately run in the field of view of the camera. We know exactly, precisely the width of this. We can count the pixels in here, and then we can calibrate our pixel count here back to a known length. Uh, so we end up with these, these measurements. Okay, so that's the principle, pretty straightforward, intuitive method, I think, of uh, evaluating and measuring perforations. 
Um, a couple of subtleties on the on the measurements to be aware of. So you'll see here how we've got a what I'll, let, let, let's call this a width measurement and a, and a height measurement. Um, and then we've got a diameter measurement. So the diameter measurement is created by finding the longest axis we can in the perforation and then taking a measurement at 90 degrees and halfway along that. So that's exactly how the API would, would measure a, a perforation. It would average those two axes. Um, and you will see that the width measurement in a perforation of this shape is nowhere nowhere close to di to a diameter measurement. So we've got 0.43 on the width, 0.55 on the on the diameter, um, and 0.77 on the on the height here. So I'm making this point about the width is because one of the other technologies now being used to measure perforation erosion is essentially based on a on a width based measurement, and that gives me a little bit of Concerned. So I'm, I'm talking here about ultra, ultrasonic measurements. Um, ultrasonic measurements have one have one clear, strong benefit um, in that they don't need need the optically clear fluid that, that we require for images. So they can work in opaque fluid and less time required to prepare the well for that type type of operation. But their, their big limitation to counterbalance that advantage is they only measure they only measure width. There's a couple of reasons they can't measure the the height or the length of this perforation. Uh, one of those is due to physical movement in the well. Um, when you're trying to measure small features like this, um, that type of tool is very prone to to stick and pull. So the perforation either in this axis gets uh, gets compressed or or, or extended um, and and the other the other reason is is just simply to do with the shape of the sensors that are used they're they're they're, they're thin but but long so they get good resolution on a on a width measurement but very poor resolution on a, on a height measurement so um so the point here is, you know, width is width is not equal to to diameter, and then diameter is not necessarily equivalent to area. If you were to do a pi r squared type equation to go from radius or diameter to, to area, um, that won't work if your perforation, unless your perforation is round or elliptical and unsymmetrical. This type of this type of shape, which is relatively common for eroded perforation, and not this is not an extreme example. I'm showing you by any means. Um, you won't be able to convert from diameter to 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 area. So when you go um, and apply this in in the perforation friction equation, um, which traditionally has used a diameter measurement. Um, I would say if you've got if you've got an area measurement available, I would definitely recommend going with the area measurement. So that this version of or, or this perforation friction equation based on Bernoulli's equation, and, and the assumption is flow through a through a circular orifice. Um, and we've seen from the image that eroded perforations are not are not circular, and the database itself tells us the average height of a, of a perforation is 13% more than the average width. And that's over, over 20,000 perforations that we've measured. So 13% might not sound huge, but when you, when you raise that number to the fourth power, the difference, the difference is actually 75%. So if you're calculating pressures or, or flow rates using Using those those values, you, you, you're going to end up with a 75% difference between your answers. So, um, if you have area available, then definitely go with area. And just to just to uh, emphasise that point, the, the example perforation that we looked at uh, a moment ago on the previous slide. So, the area calculation there will be I calculated 28% more accurate using area compared to the diameter measurement. 
Um, there'd be over over 100% difference if you actually used the width measurement rather than the, the area measurement. So be uh, yeah, I think it's a point to be aware of. And if, and if you have an area measurement, I'm I'm convinced it's definitely the best the best option to use when you when you're applying perforation friction equations. Okay, so with that background kind of covered, um, let, let's get into the results. The first one we'll look at is the, the propent, propent placement or whether or not we got um, propent into individual perforations. And we'll, we'll look at that by looking, the, looking at the percentage of perforations with propent placed or with erosion on a, on a per well basis. And we're going to do that with the two, two methods that I mentioned by looking at the measured erosion and comparing that with the, the visual erosion. When I put the data up here. Um, each, of these, each of these dots represents a single well in our database, the results from that well. So this, this well here had roughly just over 50% of the perforations with measured erosion and 50% with, with visual erosion. And that's actually a very, very poor result, the worst result in, in the database. Um, where you'd like to be, of course, is up, is up here, with 100% or close to 100% of your perforations with, with measured erosion and visual evidence of erosion as well. If you get that type of result, you can be pretty confident that all your, all your perforations, all your clusters uh, are at least getting propent into them. And again, just looking at the statistics in the database, we found that over, over half the wells that we've looked at um, produce a result with more than 80% measured and more than 80% visual erosion. And we'll see, we'll see in a minute that anything over 80% is probably a, a very good result. And that's going to mean when you look at a cluster level that nearly all your clusters are, are going to have seen uh, seen some propent in, into them. Okay, and we can also break this down again using that comparison between um, geometric stages, coloured in in green, and, and compare that with um, variable shot cluster or, or engineer stages in in, in gold. Um, it, it's not as apparent as I would have thought. But the, the engineered stages are, are slightly better. There's, there's a few more of them up here in the 8080, and generally they're a little closer to this top, top right hand quadrant where, you, where you'd like to be, with nearly all your perforations showing evidence of, of erosion. The actual figure is 4%. Um, so the, the engineered stages have 4% more perforations with both measured and visual erosions compared with the geometric stages. That to me, um, that, that, that was the conclusion that engineered stages have better propent placement results, higher percentage of perforations with, with erosion and therefore we infer with propent placed but I kind of expected the difference to be to be a bit larger than four um, percent. If you've gone to the effort of engineering your your stages, um, trying to get your propent distributed as evenly as possible, four percent didn't seem like a a big enough gain. You'd you'd hope for more. We, we'll go on to discuss why that might be. I think the engineered stages have. Uh, have suffered a little bit, and, and probably you can get a better better result and a higher differential from your your engineered stages than that. And we'll come we'll come on to that. But um, just just quickly, there's another way we can look at these results. Just just at the level of the complete database, where if we compare the the twenty thousand purse we've got in there, eighty seven percent with visual erosion, 79% with, with measured erosion. I won't go into this difference. Let's just call it an average of 83%. Um, I, think, I think I can explain why this difference happens, um, but maybe that's a little more detail than you probably need just, just now. 
And if we take that upper level to look at cluster cluster level, and if you if you if you consider one perforation in a cluster to have evidence of erosion to qualify that 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 cluster as, as having properly placed, you see the numbers get right up there into the into the mid to high to the high 90s. So the conclusion here was, um, yeah, propent, widespread propent placement is doesn't doesn't seem to be an issue. You get you're getting propent into nearly all of your clusters, which uh, which obviously that's a good that's a good result. Um, but what it doesn't what it doesn't tell you yet is is how much propent has gone into those perforations and and those clusters, and that's that's what we're going to look at. Next, when we start looking at the at the distribution. So the first result I want to share with you here is is the fact that propent uh, propent distribution seems really quite variable at cluster level. So we're we're going to see some results here where we're going to plot um, eroded area per cluster against the number of clusters in in a stage. Um, eroded area per cluster is derived just by adding up those individual perforation eroded areas to a cluster level, and it's it's important because this is our this is our this is our proxy this is our our indicator for the volume of propent placed. So while it's not a hundred percent direct relationship, you can think of eroded area per cluster. As volume of, of propent placed per per cluster. So I'm going to run a little sequence. Uh, it's, it's actually a little video, so I hope this comes over the, the internet well enough. Um, it's only about 20, 20 seconds long, but in that 20 seconds, you're going to see results from 71 individual stages. All these stages have 15 clusters per stage, so we're kind of comparing like like to like. Um, I'll start start running that, and yeah, try try not to look at the individual numbers here. The point is to to show you the variability, and you can see how how one one cluster varies to against the cluster next to it. Perhaps you see those big ones jumping out occasionally, dominant perforations. Perhaps you see a slight trend for more erosion in the clusters closest to the heel compared with the, the toe, but it's not not easy. It was a bit fast and you know the, the results are are quite quite variable cluster to cluster. So the the final result we're looking at here is actually the average of those 71. I can expand those out now because I haven't got any of those those extreme values have been uh, been averaged out. So this this now is the average result from these 71 clusters. Um, and you can still see some variations here, clusters 9 and 10. These clusters had more than their fair share of those extreme values, so the average is also a little higher. Maybe you can see that trend as well, that, that there is the best fit trend line. There is a clear trend of more, more erosion closer to the heel compared with the, with the toe. And so we can we can get some some trends, even though the the data can be quite variable. By looking at trends as well, we can we can see things like the, this preference for for erosion in, in 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 the heel. Okay, and this to me raises some some other questions. You know, is is this trend towards the heel? Is it is it something specific to 15 clusters per stage, or or how does it vary if we've got different numbers of clusters per per stage, for example? So we go on to to have a look at have a look at that. Firstly, though, we have to we have to find a method of of measuring this variability, and there's some there's some equations you can use, standard deviations and stuff. I I've been using those for a while, but I didn't find them satisfactory. And in the end, we came up with this really, 
really simple method, I think, of, of what, what I call the heel-toe ratio. So this is simply a comparison of the eroded area in all the clusters closest to the heel of the stage compared with the eroded area in all the clusters closest to the toe. We just split the, split the stage in half in the middle and we have two halves, the heel half and the, and the toe half. So it's pretty, that's a pretty crude measure and, and it only allows you to compare heel to toe. It doesn't, doesn't let you do cluster to cluster to cluster. But given the variability we have in the, in the results that we've just seen cluster to cluster, I think if we could, if we could even things up between the two halves of the well, that would be, that would be a, good, a good step forward and a good start. And if we can do that, we can refine that measurement and make it a little more sophisticated. But heel to clo seem to, seem to make sense for what we were trying to, to measure. So here's, here's how we plot that. So we put uh, in green the amount of erosion in the heel half of the, of the stage and in grey the amount of erosion in the, in the toe. So here we've got 65% in the heel, 35% in, in the toe, and that stage we'd say had a, had a, had a heel bias, a preference for erosion and we infer proper placement in the, in the heel. The result you'd be hoping for would be 50-50, the same amount of erosion, the same amount of propent placed in the heel and the toe halves of, of the well, no bias there. And then the, the final option really would be a, a stage with, with a toe bias, so more, more erosion in, in the toe than, than the heel. So that, that's our measure. That's what the results look like. Um, let's see how that um, relates to different designs of, of, of stage. So start off with geometric shot cluster designs. So all these, um, all these stages we're going to see the results for have the same number of shots per, per cluster. So we're going to shot, we're going to plot our heel toe ratio on our horizontal axis and our vertical axis, we're going to show different types of uh, stage design, basically different numbers of clusters per stage for our, for our geometric stages in, in the database. If I put the first one up here, you, you'll see what I mean. So stages with two clusters per, per stage, and there are not many of these, that's an unusual pattern to have. Um, these actually showed a preference for slightly more erosion in the in the toe of the well, in the toe of the stage. Um, so we're looking for that 50-50 again. If you look for our three cluster per stage stages, we actually do get a 50-50 relationship there. So that would appear to be a good good result. Um, Four clusters per stage is a, is a bit of an oddball. We only had two or three stages in our database with that design. For whatever reason, they were strongly favoured uh, heel, heel placement of the propent. So I think if we had, a, had more representative numbers, this would probably head back down here somewhere. So I don't think this is representative. But um, yeah, that's what we had. That's what we presented. If you remember, five, five clusters per stage was, was one of the most popular designs. Uh, that, shows, that shows a heel, heel tendency. And we continue, um, let's go up to 10 clusters per stage. Everything we're seeing now has got a, a heel tendency. And we continue, we didn't have any stages with 11 clusters per stage in the database, so that's missed as is our, where do we go next, 17 clusters per stage. Nobody nobody tried that in the wells that we've been involved with. And if I continue all the way up to 25, you'll see every single one has a, has a heel preference, okay, apart from three and two. And again, we can summarize this, this in, in a different way. So this, this chart incorporates results from 297 geometric stages. 
and where we were able to calculate a bias, 73% um, of those results um, had had a heel bias. So that's pretty pretty high number, pretty significant, I would I would say. And our average, our weighted average. So we're we're not we're not over calculating for these stages where we don't have many stages in in the database. Our average was 58% erosion. We infer propant placed in the heel and 42% in the toe. So that's a pretty strong number, I would say. Quite a lot more propant going into the into the heel of these stages than into the into the toe. So conclusion for geometric stages, the heel bias dominates. If you if you complete your complete your stages in a, in a geometric fashion, you're likely to get more propant going into the, into the heel. Pretty straightforward conclusion. And we can do exactly the same for our variable shot cluster, our engineered stages. Um, so same, same plot, heel toe bias on the horizontal axis, different cluster count per stage on the on the vertical axis and surprisingly we get the opposite result we start seeing preference for erosion in the in the toe of these so most of these designs not all of them but the majority have a preference for erosion in the in the toe Okay. And again, to, to summarize that, 69% of the stages, I forgot to put the number here, but again, it was around 300 stages have gone into this, into this chart. 69% had a, had a toe bias, and the average bias was 55% of the erosion. We infer 55% of the propant into the, into the toe, 45% in the heel. So it seems like we've gone from a, a heel bias in geometric to a toe bias in engineered stages. Um, I was surprised by that. I mean, the, the idea of an engineered stage is you get a more even propant distribution, but um, that didn't seem to be the result we get. We kind of, we speculated, well, have we, have we overdone this engineering? Have we overcompensated for our for our heel bias in the geometric wells and ended up with a toe bias and we found a, we found a way of, of 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 proving or disproving that that theory that we had and again we're going to plot heel toe bias but this time against the additional number of perforations shot in the in the toe of a stage so that's uh, that's a commonly applied method to try and balance up your your propant placement. Um, you put put more clusters into the toe. You reduce the perforation friction in the toe. Um, the frac should flow more easily into the toe, and you should end up balancing out that preference for in the geometric stage for the for the propant to flow into the into the heel. So the first result I'm, I'm going to pop up here is, is for stages where there were 30 to 40% more perforations in the toe clusters compared with the heel clusters. And we actually ended up with quite a strong toe bias. 61% of the erosion was, in the, was measured in the, in the toe clusters. If we reduce the number of perforations or the differential of perforations, a slightly better result. 20 to 30 percent by the time we get to 10 to 20 percent more perfs in the toe uh, you can see the trends heading heading the right way and if we get to up to 10 percent more perforations in the in the toe when we do arrive at that 50 50 50 more even distribution of uh, of erosion and, and of Placement. And then just to complete the pattern, 
if you put the geometric stages in there as well, um, with no, no difference between the number of perfs, that's our definition of geometric in this case, um, we end up back with our back with our heel bias. So we had the, the results here were from 90, 97 different stages, almost 100 stages went into these results. All these stages had 10 clusters per stage, so we were comparing like to like. Um, and I thought that trend was, was pretty convincing and the, the number of stages, you know, had me, had me believing this is, this is something real we're, we're seeing here. Um, I wouldn't necessarily apply, say it applies in, in, all, in all cases. Um, we only did the calculation for 10, 10 clusters per stage. The, the, the number of clusters may have, a, have an influence on it and, and all those other parameters that we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, allowed for, we haven't controlled for, may, may also have an effect as well. But for this specific set of results, then between one and 10% more perforations in the toe was the, was the, was the, the, seemed to be the ideal answer here. Again, it's, a, it's an average, but at least it, it points you to the right, to the right direction to be, to be looking at. Okay, um, I'm going to finish the results with with what was actually our strongest uh, strongest trend that we see. We, we see this trend in 98%, if not if not 99% of the wells. I can remember the occasional one that doesn't have it, um, but this this is a trend for for more propant to be placed on the low side of the well bore. So what we're going to plot here is the the measured diameter of the perforations against their phase in, in the well bore. So in our system, 180 degrees would be the low side of the, the well, um, and zero and 360 would be the would be the high side. And if I plot the first the first line I'm going to show you here, for sub data, the, these are these are perforations that we know haven't been eroded. These are our, are our reference perforations for erosion calculations. Um, we have an additional 1,500 perforations in our database like, like this. The data here is a little more noisy, um, only 1,500 perforations included. And I should say the, these figures include all, all varieties of perforations. So the, these perforations may have different nominal hole sizes. They will have different nominal nominal hole sizes, but they're all grouped in together. So this, the data points here might come from 0.37, and here they might come from, let's say, 0.42 nominal ID um, perforations. So there's a little, little bit of noise on that. But if I put on the, the 20,000 post-frac eroded perforations, we get a much smoother line. Um, the, dotted, the dotted lines, by the way, are the best, the best fit to the, to the data points, and it helps me anyway to, to look at the, the best fit line rather than the, the actual data. And on the, on the low and, and high side, sorry, on the high side of the well at 0 and 360, you can see the, 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 these numbers are pretty close, close together, and you've got a much bigger gap here. So, of course, this gap is the erosion that's, that's happening. Um, from from pre to post frac, and you can see you're getting more erosion occurring on on the low side than on the than on the high side of, of the well bore. So more 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 propant apparently going into the well on 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 the low side. Myself, I think that's some kind of a gravity gravity effect on the propant, but. Um, other people have different opinions, but um, what's hard to dispute is that it, that, you know, that is that is the that is the preference. So, how are we doing for time? Yep, I need to wrap up. So, just to just to move on to the conclusions, then. So, the trends, the trends and patterns we see in this this fairly big database now, um, they confirm quite a few things for them. So, we saw that proper placement, whether or not we get per Propant into individual perforations and clusters is generally not a doesn't seem to be a problem. You'll remember those percentages in the mid 80s for perforations, mid 90s for for clusters. 
Okay, but we also saw the volume of propant going into those clusters could be could be quite variable. But if you look at the trends, you can still gather some 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 useful information. And we also saw that for geometric stages, that you are likely to get a, a heel bias in, in geometric stages. The figures were fairly convincing to me about that. But we also saw if you engineered your stages, you could reach that, um, that a more even, you could engineer a more uniform distribution of, of, of profit. Um, so that was the key takeaway from looking at those different percentages. Um, but we also saw that you could you could overdo things as well. If if you if you overcompensated, you, you could end up with a with a just with a, a toe cluster a toe bias replacing a, a heel a heel bias. Um, so yeah, um, be careful with your engineering. Do it uh, do it well. Um, measure measure your results to confirm what you're doing. And would be would be the recommendation. OK, so I'm just going to finish off with a very quick acknowledgement as that took a little longer than I planned for my for my co-authors and all the all the log, log analysts who've contributed to the uh, the data that I was presenting here. And also, of course, I mentioned to the customers who uh, who run our services, um, let us gather the data, report back to them and whose data has been shared in uh, in what you've seen here. Um, I'll leave you uh, with a with a slide for a moment showing some 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 information. You're very welcome to either contact me directly if you if you have questions and prefer to do that by email. But I, we will open this up now to any any questions that you that you want to want to want to ask. And you can also contact, of course, your your local EV representative if you don't know who that is. The generic email address there will will get you to to your EV rep in your in your area. Okay, so with with that, please are there are there any questions? Uh, Glenn, thanks so much for the presentation. I'll help moderate here a little bit. There's a, a number of questions that came in during the the session itself in the chat channel. Uh, some of them we we think we we've probably covered, and I'll I'll just go backwards uh, chronologically, as it were, because I think okay. that that actually works quite well. Mm -hmm. um, but we had a question from Daniel Gomez about the uh, the trend in orientation and erosion as we've seen it. So, Daniel, yeah. if if you'd like, do you want to expand on that, or or was the the chart at the end uh, quite telling in that respect? Thank you, Tobin. Uh, well, my question was like, do you guys see a a, a a relation between orientation, relative orientation in the well, and erosion in the perforations? Are the uh, perforations that are, uh, you know, low side versus high side, which ones are taking more uh, propant? Is there something that you could tell from from your your measurements? Yeah, th thanks, Daniel. Well, well, ho hopefully that uh, the, the the last slide I showed you did did answer that or so most of that question. What what I what I could have added if I'd had a little more time, and, it, and it's interesting to me is the majority of those perforations that you saw there. Though those were consistent hole charges. I did I didn't mention at the beginning we don't always get that information, so that. Um, the data in there included some perforations, but we don't actually know whether they were consistent hole or whether they were regular perforating charges. And the consistent hole, of course, designed to to reduce that effect and make the phase less less important. And and perhaps they perhaps they are doing that. Perhaps if we had more charges that we knew were were regular charges, we we would see the difference. But I just didn't have enough data in the database, just didn't have enough information from the customers on those regular charges to make the comparison. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the charges you saw there were probably consistent whole. And yet we still see that phase, that phase preference. Um, I'm not saying it's not an improvement on the, on the, on the regular standard charges. 
but um, but the effects still still clearly there. Thank you. Okay, and we also had some questions here from from Carlos. If if you're there as well, you had uh, questions about the erosion difference between heel and toe of the well. So again, if you'd like to expand on your question, then, then perhaps Glenn will be able to give an answer. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation, by the way. Um, lots of uh, good info. Uh, you did um, uh, show a lot of examples uh, to answer the question, uh, but just to go a little further, there is um, a lot of uh, reports saying that the, the more clusters in a stage, uh, the better production. So, you know, obviously that's a, that's a positive. But in, uh, in many of the cases uh, in, in your slide, uh, by erosion, obviously, uh, it, uh, it shows that um, some of the, the, um, the clusters uh, were uh, taking some of the sand, and this is just going by erosion, obviously. But, uh, uh, so it's kind of uh, um, a little confusing, you know, to see that there's a lot of production by many clusters, but there is only a few clusters taken in the, the propane. Um, so what would you say, or would you say anything about that? Yeah, I, I mean, you do, you do raise a very good point. Um, how, how this all relates to production is only, um, is pretty subjective. Um, understanding production from from these horizontal wells is is definitely still a big challenge for the industry. It's um, it's not one we're particularly involved in. We're we're in this earlier stage of, of evaluating the frac, but I, I mean I do believe that uh, the better job of you do of getting a uniform propent placement, certainly you, you've got to, you've got to think the, the, the higher the likelihood you're also going to get even distribution and uniform drainage of your reservoir um yeah you, you're not you're hopefully not going to leave any bypassed oil or gas in there if you if you evenly frack the frack the well um not sure that answered your your question but i hope hope it helped a, a little bit carlos yes thank you Okay, thanks, Glyn. We've got some very recent questions as well on other mitigating factors that can be taken to improve that propent distribution. Uh, so Michael Granger has asked, was the diversion material taken into account during the pumping, or is that another parameter we need to, to look at in more detail? Yes, um, in, in, this, in this study, Michael, we, we haven't accounted for diversion material. Um, we've, done, we've done that on individual wells with specific customers. Um, but I, I have a feeling as well, diversion material is sometimes one of those parameters we're not, we're not told about. So the customer may be, may be using diverters, uh, but don't necessarily tell us. <laughs> so... Um, but others, others do, and uh, obviously we, we can we can focus in on that then in our results if we if that information is shared with us, and we can we, you know we can produce certain plots and charts that help them understand the effect of uh, of diversion material. But the, the general answer, no, we, we haven't taken that into account in at least in this in this study and in and in the paper. But it's certainly uh, so it's certainly something interesting to to look at on a, on a bigger scale in the future. Thank you. Okay, as well, Glenn, we've we've got some uh, good questions here about the performance, I guess, uh, and the, the the variation between standard and consistent hole charges. So, yeah. uh, have we got uh, any comparisons from the data that we have, or is that one of the the topics that we're looking to cover as we we grow more and more analysis? Yeah, that 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 goes back to my earlier comments about. Sometimes we don't get as much information on the perf charges used as, as we'd hope. Um, some some customers just like to tell us it's it's the perf charge has a nominal hole size of 0.37. Um, we don't learn whether it's uh, equal hole supposed to be an equal hole charge or 
um, how it's tested or where that number comes from. Um, so I, I'm afraid we have we haven't been able to do as much on that as as we as we would like. Where where we have been told, or we've been told the type of charge, I, I would estimate in about 50% of the the data. So of that 50% that we that we know, 90% of them are uh, are equal hold charges. So at least the perforation or the operating companies we're working with primarily use use equal equal entry charges, and we don't we don't have a, a full comparison yet against standard standard charges. And I'm uh, did, did did that answer your, your question, Blake? Uh, yeah, I was kind of. More interested in is now exiting in uh, base hole uh, performance. Uh, basically, holes uh -huh. that have been fractured, uh, holes that we shoot either in the heel or holes that we've imaged before frack. It, uh, just measuring the variability of, of the so-called equal entry uh, charges. Sorry, I I misinterpreted your question. Yeah, I I missed the point that you were talking about about base holes. So yes, um, I think I, I think I can answer that in the positive now. So um, yeah, base holes again. The the fourteen hundred and fifty odd perfs I showed you at the end there in the last chart. The, the majority of those were would have been equal entry hole charges, and the variability is 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 let's say it's probably surprising to to most people. Um, I think the charge manufacturers don't don't do themselves a favor the way they advertise these charges. So they they talk about variability numbers of three, four, five percent on on these equal hold charges. Um, if you go back and ask them what do they mean by variability, um, I'm sure they will tell you. Um, but that's a that's a statistical number they're giving you. It's the it's the me. It's the average of the standard deviation, so it makes it makes the number look really small, three, four, five percent, but it does allow for quite a big variation, um, 15, 20 percent difference between the largest and the smallest hole. So I, I think their marketing and their method of communicating what the what the what the variation here is. Um, uh, could could be better in my my opinion. Yeah. So dig dig in with your manufacturers and your charge suppliers. What what those numbers actually mean, and you, and you'll you'll see there's a bigger variation than they I think want you to believe. And we certainly see that variation in the base holes that we we've, we've looked at. All right. Okay, Glenn, there was another question from Teresa Voss, uh, and I believe this is really to do with the correlation of our results with other measurements. So, Teresa, would, would you like to expand on your question about correlation with limited entry pressure drop? No. Okay. Well, Glenn, okay. do you have any any comments or observations regarding uh, that subject? Um, yes, I can. I can make a comment. Although there's someone else on the call, or at least there was to begin with, who's much better placed than me to uh, to comment on that. So I pro I'll probably refer you to a different a different paper there, um, Teresa. Um, paper where Dave Dave Kramer was the was the main author um, looks at this in, in quite a bit of detail. We we co-authored co that with with Dave, and um, in that paper we did make that comparison with you know what 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 we were getting from the from the perforation images against um, against the the pressure the pressure calculations. Um, yeah, it's a really really interesting read that was one of the most popular. And interesting papers from 2019 hydraulic frac conference. So if you haven't read that one, um, I can't remember the number the number of the paper. If Dave's on the on the call, maybe he could help. 
type that in for us. Otherwise, um, happy to happy to let you know the number of that that paper to raise if you want to have a have a closer look. I'll look it up, Lynn. Okay. Thanks, Dave. I've just posted it in the chat channel there. So uh, it was one nine four three three four. And yeah, I see another 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 question from Teresa there on the what the pressure design was for the different wells. Um, typically, no, Teresa. That's uh, again one of those bits of missing information that we we would love to have and love to be able to try and correlate against the erosion measurements that we're making. But but typically, we don't we don't get the uh, all the all the frac all the frac parameters. Yeah, Glenn, I'll just say, since you brought the subject up, uh, I think it's very important to evaluate pressures. It's golden when you have a heel, down all heel gauge, you can very accurately account for the, the uh, casing or uh, tubular friction when you have that combined with the surface gauge and prop concentration information. But uh, really important to, to, to tie and bring this all together and, and make improvements in your process. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I absolutely agree. You know, the more the more data you can look at and, and correlate and, and, and understand, the, the better better you're going to better you're going to know what, what's happening and, and, and improve upon it. So yes, please uh, please consider all as many types of data as you as you can. Question from Chris there, Tobin. Did you did you get the first part of the the question? Uh, confer, confirmation bias, or I can scroll up and try and find that. Yes, I have it here. Is, is actually Chris? Are you still on the call? Would you like to 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 take that one directly? Yeah, yeah. sure. Can you hear me? I hear you, Chris. All right, great. So yeah, my question was about slide nine, which was a scatter plot showing uh, where you had uh, visual and I think uh, measured uh, erosion. Yeah. And on the chart, you were saying something like, uh, I, I think, let's see if I wrote it down, most of the stages were actually seeing evidence of erosion mm -hmm. and uh, or most of the most of the clusters. And my yeah. thinking was, you know, if you're a company that's investing in downhole imaging, you're mm -hmm. probably already pretty invested in good perforating practices. So we're probably seeing, I think, the best this data can possibly, well, I don't say the best it can possibly be, but a, a data set that's biased towards excellence. And your quote unquote average operator that maybe doesn't acquire this data, probably the data doesn't look as good as this, is, is my guess. A, a, any sense for that or what kind of improvement you see in this performance with customers who do multiple jobs with you? Um, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, w I would say our our data set is probably not representative of, of the industry. The uh, the operators are working with us and, and using this and other diagnostic methods. Uh, you know, they're they're clearly trying to change stuff, trying to improve stuff. Um, so they may be trying different things that the rest of the industry isn't isn't trying or, or isn't measuring so they yeah they, they may have different different practices and procedures that they they apply so yes the data our data probably does reflect that they they are they are likely to be doing different different things um, and on that on that question about operators that we've worked with yeah there's one there's one operator immediately come well there's more than there's more than one but um, yeah, there's one that we've done a series of, of wells with, and, and it's it, it is a perfect case study. I'm I'm trying to trying to persuade them to 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 write a joint paper with us, because yeah, that they they clearly show the progression of of relatively low um, percentages of, of of perforations and clusters initially. They had strong strong heel biases. It was a uh, is geometric stages in their first wells, um, and then they they started making the the, the changes 
um, that we've that we've discussed in the paper today. Um, they, they moved to engineered. They did some they did some experimenting with uh, extreme numbers of uh, additional perforations in the toe, and occasionally extreme numbers additional in the in the heel, which is very unusual. And you know they just wanted to prove they could control. The distribution, and um, you know, we did we did see all that in results, and yeah, I would say they've definitely definitely made progression, and and now are are, are getting better fracks because they've they've run the diagnostics. Um, I was being I was being one of those diagnostics. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're not that company that you're talking about, Glenn. But I'll say your your uh, Evie's recommendation to shoot base holes. We've done a lot of that, and we've uh, un, un seen fascinating information on the variability from vendor to vendor. An equal entry hole charge, that's that's just a marketing term, and, and you've addressed uh, some of the issues with that very well in your previous comments. But, yeah, we're doing things as a company quite differently based on uh, our, our you know, looking at the, uh, the base holes and uh, their variability, and uh, not just by vendor, but by position in the well and uh, the inclination. So we, we've changed our, uh, we're, we're in the process of changing our process, uh, perforating processes significantly based on this work. Oh, thanks, Dave. Uh, and, thanks, Dave. And, yeah. and Glenn as well, just to round out this subject, we had a question that relates to that from, from Freddie earlier on, uh, just to, to give some idea of, of what the, the percentage of perforations that we we analyzed where there was neither any evidence of visual erosion or measured erosion. And perhaps, you know, in, in that, that context, you, you might be able to give um, some indication of the, the improvements as a, as a percentage that, that that operator took on that journey. Uh, yeah, for, for the example I just, I was just referencing. Um, yeah, um, that, 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 that operator started off with, when they were shooting the geometric stages um, around the, with some, no, actually the average for some of the wells uh, in the 50 and 60 percent, which really was a, was a, was a poor result. Um, and I would say now they're consistently up, up, up above and into that 80 percent range of, of perforations and, and, and a bit higher, obviously, with the, with the percentage of clusters that are, are getting erosion. Uh, and getting properly placed, um, still, still some work to do with them to try and even out that propent. I think, if I remember, they still, they still have a, still do have a bit of a, a, a heel bias going on, but it, it's better than it was. And they, you know, they, they have plans um, to change. As, as Dave was talking uh, from the Conoco Phillips perspective, there, um, they, they have plans to make some future changes and. I'm hopeful we'll be involved and, and help them confirm if those were successful or not. Okay, thanks, Glyn. Uh, I think we're, we're getting close to time now. Um, I'm also aware we, we put together a, a little questionnaire that we sent out prior to the, the meeting. For anyone that hasn't filled it out, uh, please do it retrospectively. It'd be great to get the information in there. Uh, but if, if you'd like, Glenn, we can take a few moments just to share the results of that, and maybe that will spark a bit more discussion. Yeah, absolutely. You should, you should be able to share your screen now if you're going to do that, Tim. Indeed. If you just confirm that that's come through. It has, yep. Yeah, so of the attendees across the two sessions that we've run today, one for the Eastern Hemisphere and now one for the for the US and, and Canadian markets and, and South American markets, we had over 20 responses or uh, so far. And we can see that for the first question about perforations types used, uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, geometric designs. Some operators are, are using a mixture of the two, uh, but very few are outright in the engineered camp just yet. So I, I guess from from what you've seen and presented today, Glenn, there's definitely room for improvements and some optimization to be had there. 
I would I would suggest so. I mean, it's going to it's going to vary from play to play and formation to formation, but um, yeah, def definitely worth uh, considering. And likewise, there's a, a quite strong correlation for the uh, low perforation count uh, or low cluster count rather in in each stage. Uh, the majority sitting between one and five uh, clusters per stage. Uh, how does that fit then with the observations that you you saw in uh, your distribution of, of clusters? Yeah, I, th I think we had a pretty we, we probably had a wider distribution there. You know, we we saw those peaks at five, ten, and fifteen, which we're not quite seeing there. I, I don't think so. Yeah, that probably relates to that question about how representative our data is of the industry. Perhaps in this little sample we've got here, we're getting more industry type uh, industry-based averages rather than the customers have been working with now who are more prone perhaps to to try different things and try to try to get um, better better results and experiment a little with the, the cluster counts and other other parameters that can be can be varied okay and we also got a, a breakdown here of the the type of diagnostics that have been used uh, across the the teams involved and I mean, traces and surface pressure monitoring is, is clearly the standout uh, solution. And we saw that again from the, the call we had earlier today. Uh, a little bit of micro seismic going on and otherwise a, a relatively small distribution for distributed acoustics, ultrasonic scanning and, and video information in there. But if there's anybody on the call that contributed to it, to this survey, and it would be great if you, you would share any of the successes or pros, cons, or otherwise of, of some of the techniques you, that you've been been trying to date? Uh, this is Chris Jenkins from Chesapeake. Uh, we've tried the sealed wellbore pressure monitoring that, uh, that Devon Energy spoke about at Hydraulic Fracturing Conference in February in two different basins, and we found that uh, that was beneficial for uh, helping us understand uh, our perfect efficiency with different uh, limited entry designs. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting, Chris. Yep, um, yep, that was that was a that was a good a good paper, and, and it, it showed the benefits. And it's good to good to hear it uh, confirmed by by another operator. Okay, uh, and then just to, to wrap up, uh, what type of perforating charge you use? Uh, and again, a, a strong uh, trend towards the, the standard charge design, if you like, um, but actually quite a large uptake in a relatively short time for the constant or consistent entry hole uh, systems. Mm -hmm. So I guess, guess that's definitely gaining traction over time, um, but not many have, have experimented yet with angled charges. So. If there's anyone here that, that has an experience of that, then perhaps they'd like to comment. Nope, we didn't get that one person on, <laughs> not to worry. Um, OK, well, I, I guess just to, to wrap up at the very end, we, we also put a little score rating in here, uh, really just for our own benefit to get some feedback on, on how we fared today and how useful you found the information. If there is anybody that hasn't filled out the questionnaire yet, but would, would like to just take a minute or two to, to go through it, that would be fantastic. And any any comments or, or, or notes that you want to drop us, then please do. Uh, as Glyn has said, we're here to help. Um, I should say that if you visit our website, there's two very, very useful things on here on the homepage. Firstly, you'll get a, a nice friendly face from your local sales representative. Uh, and, and you can contact them as a first port of call to get any extra information. But also, we uh, we regularly post a, a video update on the activities and services that we've been running. So if you're not already on that linked list, then, then please take a moment to sign up or at least consider that. And it's a very short form to fill out with some contact details uh, in there. But what that lets you do is, is you'll get these case studies that we produce fed directly to your inbox and you'll get an update to say when the next one's out. These cover a wide range of topics, not just the, the perforation imaging that we've seen, but a whole other uh, range of different challenges, including wellbore restrictions and, and uh, isolation of water, et cetera. 
so if you haven't signed up, then please take a moment to consider that. Uh, otherwise, Glyn, I'll hand back to you for um, a final thought, if you like, and then we'll wrap up from there. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks, Tobin. It, it was really just to just to see if there's any last minute comments um, or, or, or questions. Otherwise, I think we'll we'll probably close it close it out there. Um, as I said, please please contact me at my email address that I was showing for a while. If uh, if you'd like to ask me something or or uh, otherwise, yeah, thank thank you very much for for participating. Um, and I hope that you all stay stay safe, and we're we're back to back to normal working sometime sometime soon. But many thanks for many thanks for joining us. It was really really appreciated.